So I have the unique pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker for the conference, Dr. Manjit Misra. Dr. Misra is the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And as you will hear, he is a very interesting person. If you've had the opportunity to finish reading that book that was available at the beginning of the conference that talks about the origins of the, the extension systems in Canada, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, you will know that the National Institute of Food and Agriculture is the federal partner for the extension systems in every state and territory uh, of, of the United States. So from his vantage point currently as director, Dr. Misra is the most senior person for extension in the country. And we're just delighted that you're gonna spend time with us today. But you will also hear that he has a very interesting background and a unique perspective about agriculture. He is a seed scientist. He is an educator. He is devoted to bringing innovative new ideas into agriculture. And we are so privileged to have him here with us today. So before he comes up on the stage, I want to warn you that we're going to have a Q&A after his talk. He's agreed to take some questions. So jot them down, be ready to ask him questions, and let me bring to the podium Dr. Manjit Misra. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, organizers of this uh, conference, uh, Kerry and uh, Chancellor Frank, President Samuel, and uh, all others who had a part in organizing this conference. This is a wonderful uh, conference. I understand there are people from over 40 countries. Well, I have a challenge for you. Next year, let's do it for 80 countries. <laughs> I think we can do it. And I will be glad to help you to do it. So um, as you can tell, the name <clears throat> Manjit Misra is an all-American name. <laughs> uh, I originally uh, came from India. We'll tell you a little bit about my journey and uh, I was uh, raised in, uh, surrounded by rice, sugarcane, coconut trees, and banana trees. It was just absolutely beautiful. I was going to be a metallurgical engineer. And, you know, in India or Africa, Every parent wants their son or daughter to be an engineer or a doctor, you know that. <laughs> so I was uh, uh, going to be a metallurgical engineer. Actually, I was standing in the line to take admission into metallurgical engineering. <clears throat> and then there was a table next to the metallurgical engineering. It said agricultural engineering. I said, what is? agricultural engineering. It was not known at all. <clears throat> and there was at the table, the professor who was from University of Missouri, and he, here is what happened. University of Missouri had a program through USAID to design the curriculum at the university where I graduated from, the Odisha. University of Agriculture. Odisha is in the East Coast by uh, Bay of Bengal. And uh, University of Missouri designed our curriculum based on the land-grant mission. So I was exposed to the land-grant mission from the very early education. And I loved it, that integration of the research and extension and education. And we have carried that uh, message 
at Iowa State University. Well, let me then say that uh, I came to University of Missouri uh, to do my graduate studies and uh, got two degrees and one wife. <laughs> and that is through 4-H. I know you have connections with 4-H. And uh, I was uh, an, a token international student at the 4-H annual conference. <laughs> so I want to tell the young people that are in this room, take some risks, folks. It, it pays off. I went to that uh, annual 4-H uh, state conference and uh, my wife Jane, she was a state delegate from a small place, Festus, Missouri. <laughs> and we uh, met and they were doing a dancing. Now there are people who can dance and there are others like us. <laughs> So they were doing a line dancing. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the dancing yesterday. <laughs> and uh, so we started talking to each other. And she informed me that she is coming to University of Missouri to uh, go to school there. <clears throat> so when she came, we met. We became best friends. And after over 40 years of marriage, we are still best friends. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Then uh, after graduating from uh, University of Missouri, uh, I went to Iowa State. And guess what? I was hired as an extension seed agent. And I love extension. You know, at NIFA, of course, we work as uh, Dr. Wataki mentioned. And thank you, Dr. Wataki, for that introduction. When uh, she is one of my mentors, and uh, I have learned so much from you. Thank you. So uh, at Iowa State University, I became a seed extension agent and traveled all over Iowa. As uh, you know, uh, NIFA <coughs> works in close partnership with the land-grant institutions, over 100 land-grant institutions, and other institutions to discover knowledge through research, but then to diffuse that knowledge through extension, and of course, educate the leaders of tomorrow, which is the theme of this conference. So in extension, what I really learned has become extremely valuable. It is about people, isn't it? It's about people. Extension agents are the unsung heroes and heroines of agriculture and food. I'm so much uh, really uh, grateful that I started with extension. By the way, I had a joint extension research appointment, 75% extension and 25% research. One thing that is so important to recognize that in extension is not just delivering the knowledge. Extension is also assessing what is the need for research. That is so useful. It's a two-way street. We need to remember that. So uh, at Iowa State, um, I worked for about, I forget now, uh, for maybe 38, 40 years, <clears throat> and uh, became the director of the Seed Science Center in uh, 1991. And uh, the reason I bring it up, we conducted programs in 79 countries in the last 25 years. And I bring it up for a purpose because I think it is important for this global collaboration. You know, when you think about food and agriculture, we are all connected. So what happens in Africa, what happens in Latin America, what happens in Asian Pacific, 
is going to be happening in our source. I'll talk about that a little bit more or perhaps through questions and answers. It is about developing policies. It's about harmonizing policies, regional, global, and national. That really is the big picture of improving the food security and safety. So in NIFA, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our vision, our priorities, and how we can collaborate together. Because I think you are a class organization. These are the type of organizations we want to collaborate with. Because there is an African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I, I traveled to many countries in Africa. We had programs in 34 countries of Africa. And we learned a lot. But that will be topic of another discussion. So in NIFA, our priorities are this. <clears throat> innovation, and somebody talked about innovation just now. Innovation is going to be in the center of NIFA's priorities. And in innovation, <clears throat> food and health is going to be a very critical part of our innovation. You know, when you think about it, we have not made the connection between food and health as strongly as we should. We certainly eat for energy, but I think we need to think about eating for health. You know, my wife uh, is Roman Catholic, and we used to eat fish every Friday. Now we eat uh, salmon, quinoa, two, three days a week. At the personal level, people are making different kinds of diet selections. So when I think about the budget of uh, NIFA, uh, we have little under $2 billion budget. And uh, when you think of the increase in NSF or NIH, their increases are bigger than the NIFA budget. Why? Because we have not made the case of the intersection between food and health. So we are considering NIFA's slogan let food be thy medicine. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let food be thy medicine. And uh, the other important cr cr uh, key area of innovation is going to be how do we make agriculture as an engine of economic growth? How do we make agriculture as an engine of economic growth. Did you know, I didn't know myself, that NIFA administers the entire SBIR, Small Business Innovation Grant, and the STTR programs for the entire Department of Agriculture? I did not know that. So we need to, you, you, I was asking Kerry, what is SPUR? Because I said, ha, huh, that's a word spur the innovation, spur the economic growth. You know, in many communities, to spur the economic growth, we need small businesses. We need all, big and small. No question about it. But we also need small businesses because they are very much local. Agriculture is a local subject. A seed that will grow in a certain part of the state will not grow in another. So I think we need local leaders who understand not just agriculture, but culture. But culture. Because these are the entities that will become community leaders. So what we need is also small businesses, innovations. We just uh, 
invested $100 million with uh, five AI institutions, artificial intelligence. Somebody jokingly told me, Manjit, we used to think AI as artificial insemination. Um, artificial intelligence centers, five of them, in collaboration with NSF. So that is going to be also uh, quite a bit. Somebody just now talked about how technology, how we really need to think of technology and how young people are not afraid of technology. But we need to be thinking about responsible application of technology. When biotechnology came down the pike, <clears throat> there was so much misinformation, disinformation, that the technology had a rough start. Now with gene editing and with other technologies such as artificial intelligence, I think we need to be very proactive and make sure that the technology is such that the politics does not run ahead of science. We need to be very careful about that. So those are the innovations, some examples of innovation that uh, we will be making front and center for uh, our funding. Then how are we going to do this work? I talk about four C's, four C's. <coughs> The first C is capacity building. We are going to build the capacities, long-term capacity. This is, this is extremely important that the states have the experimentation funding and extension funding, which is the base, so that they can actually design programs that come down the pike in a hurry. You can't really do this. You know, you don't uh, think about this kind of, you don't sell Christmas trees in January. You have to think about getting prepared. So the capacity building funding that we provide, that is going to be very, very much important for all land grant institutions and not just the 1862s, but the 1890s and the 1994s. That's first C, capacity. The second C is collaboration. When we talk about collaboration, you know, I talked about how we are collaborating with NSF. We are also going to collaborate within USDA. Just uh, a couple of weeks back, we uh, went together with ARS. I am sure that many of you are familiar with ARS, which is the Agricultural Research Service, which is the internal funding agency for research in USDA. NIFA is the external funding agency. ARS, which does wonderful work, is the internal research agency. We went together and we stood up a nutrition hub together, food and nutrition. So we also collaborate within USDA. Then we collaborate with other federal agencies such as I mentioned NSF, also NIH. We are adapting the NIH grant uh, management system to NIFA. Some of you who are the grantees, you will really appreciate it. You can see your status of your proposal, funding and all that in real time in real time. And you can track it, what is happening in real time. That we are borrowing and adapting from NIH. That is collaboration. But collaboration with the private sector is extremely important. Because sometimes the private sector, it's not about funding from the private sector, it's about the knowledge. The private sector has tremendous amount of knowledge. You have to do the work in the front end, negotiating. What are some of the things that the private sector and public sector can do? But the PPP, the public and private sector partnership model is something that NIFA is also going to be looking at. 
So that is collaboration. <clears throat> the third C is going to be cultivation. Cultivation, not just of the ground, which is important, but cultivation of next generation leaders. We just invested $262 million in this program called From Learning to Leading. The next generation. And in that program, there will be two central elements. One is going to be diversity, and the second is going to be equity. Diversity to me is extremely important. You know, uh, allow me to digress a little bit. I'm a professor at I served as a professor at Iowa State University, so I digress a lot. Uh, and I can speak for 55 minutes on any subject. <laughs> but I will come back to the point. Diversity, you know, when I was a seed scientist, I found the seeds to be so diverse. So diverse. You know, in nature, diversity creates beauty. The fall is coming. Pretty soon the leaves in the trees will become yellow, then turn to velvet red, and then crimson red. Because of these various colors, it will be a festival of colors. So in nature, diversity creates beauty. But in workplace, diversity produces creativity. If I only talk to people who look like me, good looking, <laughs> just we got to have fun, right? <laughs> Speaks like me, talks like me, thinks like me, then why do I need others? I could look at a mirror. But if you listen, you know, it's about actually listening. It's about listening with your eyes and ears, not just ears. So if you listen to people who look differently from different national origin, and of people who have different thoughts, it's also diversity of thoughts, not just looks, gender, and national origin, but of thoughts, you learn a lot. And guess what? We have to get our young people in that mental state because they are going to be global citizens. They need to really know the culture. If they are going to go to another country and work there, they need to know about their culture, not just agriculture. And hopefully they are taking some languages all our kids, we encourage them in high school to take at least one, maybe two, languages. So I think this is going to be the cultivation. Diversity is going to be a very key element. The second is equity. What is equity? Equity is not equality. Equity is not equality. Equity is actually helping someone as they need, bringing them up if they have not been at the table, if they are in a minority role, then helping them to bring them up, lift them up with things that they need. A certain amount, a certain seed only grows in a certain soil. If you plant it in another soil, it will not grow. So how do you really treat that seed? It needs sunlight. It needs fertilizer. It needs cultural conditions. So everything is slightly different. So we need to also then enhance, facilitate the collaboration between 1862s, 1890s, and the tribal. And it is really happening quite a bit. 
and it needs to happen. Because think of this, in same county there may be extension folks from 1862s and 1890s working. Why couldn't they work together? Why couldn't they go to the legislature and ask for funding together? Those are the kind of things that really is going to be important. So equity to me is this. Equity is social justice made visible. Social justice made visible through actions, not just words, but through action. That is equity. So those are the two things that are going to be critical for the uh, cultivation. Then the last one, which is very dear to my heart, is communication. So we talked about capacity, we talked about collaboration, we talked about cultivation, and the fourth one is communication. By the way, you tell me when my time is five minutes before, so that I can, I can see it from here. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, communication, communication is something that as scientists, as researchers, we really do not communicate very well. <clears throat> we do not communicate very well. I think uh, we are so much focused on data and we ought to have data. We need to have evidence. But when we are telling our success, it needs to be storytelling. It needs to capture the heart. The data is in the mind. And mind is like a market square. It's fleeting. If you want to make a message really received, it's like uh, you, you really need to capture at the visceral level. Think of having a video on PBS of a little child who is skipping and jumping to the school because she had a good nutritious breakfast. And tell them how that thing came about. What research investments were made to make that happen? Our young people think food comes from the grocery store. There is a tremendous amount of research and you know there are a lot of hands behind the scene that is working to make that food available. Uh, allow me to digress. I have been to several countries. I was in Ukraine in uh, mid 90s. There you know was such a fantastic food system. So not only that uh, we need to give the message of food and nutrition, but availability. What I mean by that is in many countries, the bread comes once a week on a certain day. Once a week on a certain day, people line up to get the bread. Here we have so much selection whether I shall have keto bread, or white bread, or wheat, we get upset if our pizza is not delivered in half an hour or less. So maybe that has actually spoiled us. Maybe that has actually spoiled us. We, we need to think about just how we give our message. Allow me to tell you this, we made a movie one hour movie on seeds for the youth to recruit and retain youth to agriculture. And in this movie, we certainly talked about science, but when we talked about seed dispersion, we did not talk about really the scientific data, but a little kid 
blowing on the dandelion and the seeds are dispersing. We had an episode, this, is, this has six episodes, 10 minutes each, and now the professors, FFA, 4-H, they are all using this to start a dialogue, a conversation on seeds. We had an episode, say, that was titled, A Day Without Seeds. A Day Without Seeds. And we got uh, Thor Hansen, a famous wild biologist, really to narrate. And here he gets up in the morning. He didn't sleep well because the mattress was not there because it comes from cotton seed. So he says, well, I'll just go and have a cup of coffee. No, <laughs> you can't have a cup of coffee because the coffee comes from coffee seeds. He says, well, I'll have a bagel. No. Well, I'm a little tired, I'll just drive back, but there is no gas hall, so he can drive back. Finally, he says it's a crummy day without seeds. So, so what I'm saying is, you really need to think about how you are communicating. We also need to communicate in such a way so that, uh, and this is where extension excels, we need to respect the culture. I will give you, thank you. I'll give you uh, very quickly an episode uh, that we did where uh, in Zambia, a lot of kids go blind, and this is global. A lot of kids go blind because they don't have vitamin A in their food. And uh, yellow maize has vitamin A, but they wouldn't eat it because the color is yellow. To them, white color is color of strength. Yellow is color of weakness. So they wouldn't eat it. Guess who changed the equation? The mothers, moms. They said that, no, my kid is not going to go blind. So when they mash those, you know, maize and soybean and other kinds of things to make a porridge, they started singing. My kid is not going to go blind. My kid is not going to go blind. And they had regalia, beautiful dresses. They started dancing. And they started small businesses. They started small businesses where they had lots of different kinds of food out of this yellow maize. So what I'm saying is you need to be sensitive to the cultural. Sometimes uh, an invention, an innovation could be wonderful, but people are not going to accept it if there is such a thing. So socioeconomics becomes a very big deal and we are funding some of the socioeconomic studies as well. So I talked about capacity, talked about collaboration, cultivation and communication. So I think uh, to maybe now I have only a couple of minutes. So to close this uh, presentation, this is uh, all about future, isn't it? This is all about future. We cannot predict the future, but we can build the future. And it is the young people who will become the leaders of uh, future. Uh, I have some good news while I'm closing. I think you will hear this afternoon that there will be an announcement of $22 million funding for some of the agricultural economics projects. And Colorado State University is part of that funding. So uh, if I may close, Dr. George Washington Carver is my personal hero. And let me close with this. What we are doing here today, 
maybe 20 years from now, people will look back and say that we anticipated well, we invested in the future, and we developed the next generation of Dr. George Washington Carvers, and they changed the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that inspiring uh, speech, Dr. Misra. We have an opportunity for questions. Um, we have one question okay. we'll start off with from Menti, and we can pass, pass the microphone around the room after that. In the spirit of food for health, what are some NIFA-supported initiatives to overcome food deserts affecting more than 20 million people in the US today? I think, uh, can you hear me okay from, <clears throat> okay. Uh, one thing that NIFA is doing is first to develop healthy foods. And we have already developed a low glycemic rice that will be released very, very soon. So to develop the healthy food is one thing that can be uh, very helpful. And I think when you talk about food desserts, I, I think, um, you know, it's again developing that local leadership. How do we encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables? That will be very key, and we are in investing in that area. Fruits and vegetables is going to be a key uh, part of our investment. Urban agriculture is uh, part of that investment, but it is not so much about urban agriculture. I'm just thinking about uh, we will be helping people to grow. You know, when you uh, eat uh, a cherry tomato directly from the plant, it tastes different, doesn't it? So how do we really in, in, uh, in make uh, people interested to grow their own food is what it will be that we will be investing on. I think I saw a question in this area of the room. Yes, at the back. You, yes. And then you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Mishra. Actually, I want to thank you for two things. First, um, thanks to NIFA for funding me as a graduate student and during my re uh, master's program for my research in food safety. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you. Um, second is uh, thanks um, thank you for uh, walking us through your journey as immigrants, and it is very re uh, relatable to me. Um, so my question here is, <clears throat> excuse me, my question here is, what are the pros and cons? Uh, because you come from a very different cultural background, and what is wh what? How did you um, uh, actually work here in the United States and then globally? W what were your challenges, and what were the positive sides of it? Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think um, this was a question that uh, I gave a keynote at Investor Missouri and they asked me, what would you tell the young people based from your journey and your experience? And what I told them that when you are given an opportunity, say yes, say yes. I think that's what I will say from my journey, you know, uh, there will be always, so to speak, uh, reasons why you cannot do it. But overcome that temptation to say no. Accept the challenge and you'll be surprised that uh, when you put in the interest and the effort Things actually organize themselves to help you to achieve your goal. So I would say that um, the challenges, uh, I, I had some challenges. For example, 
you know, to get adapted to the American culture is different. In India, it is not so much individual. It's more family. It's more community. But in US, you are basically, I, I have, I will tell you just something. Um, in our performance evaluation, we, I always like, write, like to write we. But here, we does not mean that you did it, yeah. <laughs> right? So you have to say I. Yeah. So those are some of the nuances that uh, are there, no matter uh, what culture you go to. But in general, I found this culture is easier to adapt than many other cultures because there is a welcoming uh, opportunity to have freedom. Even if there is individuality, there is freedom. So I think uh, I will tell you this, that uh, after we got married, we went back to India because she had agreed very surprisingly to go back to India with me. But after, to make the long story short, after four months, my mother told me, take her back to US, she's not happy here. <laughs> And we did. So I think there are challenges, but I think the opportunities are very good. It's what you make of it. Go for it, go for it. Question here at the, at, from this gentleman. Ooh. Oops, sorry. Not at all. Well, thank you so much. You'll be, you'll be the next up okay. then. <laughs> I think what your, your talk deserved a standing ovation, really. I think we were all so moved. We were still taking it in. Thank you very much. I'm Jane Lowicki Zuka, Senior Youth Advisor with the Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security at USAID. And I wanted to ask if you could think of some kind of key priorities for working across the interagency, across those seas. What are they for you? including uh, this, with youth. Thank you. Th thank you for this question. This is an excellent, excellent question. <clears throat> you see, because USAID had a program in, I came to US in 71. You can tell I like it here. <laughs> um, I came in 71. That time USAID had a lot of programs at, oh, I would say half a dozen universities in India exchange program, graduate student program. I came as a graduate student. I think the first thing that comes to mind is with the interagency, USAID, NIFA, the World Bank, and multilateral donor agencies, we could start a graduate student exchange program. That would be absolutely fantastic. And not only just the graduate student program, but also undergraduate exchange program. I think it needs to start at the undergraduate. You know, if our students can go to other countries for three, four weeks, get exposed to their education as well as culture. And not only that our students go, then their students come. We have, uh, by the way, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, NIFA is enhancing its international program. In fact, we are going to rename it, not call it an international program, call it a global program. And allow me to tell you why we are saying this. An international program means it's out there, somewhere out there. But a global program includes US. When we think about in you know, a global program, we all benefit. We all benefit. So I think graduate exchange, undergraduate exchange, it starts with the people. Certainly we can do development projects and that's good. But I think if we think of how do we really encourage people to go and come, let the world come to us and let us go to the world. Our final question is from this gentleman who's been waiting very patiently. <laughs> I love when you spoke about receiving feedback. My daddy was watching me and I said that should be the 
Um, you know, what I would love to find out from you is how does a young man like myself with a startup with an organization that is working tremendously towards engaging youth and children, how do we collaborate? You know, how do we come in a room like this and meet people and collaborate and literally get things off the ground? Because for us in the Caribbean, the resources are very limited. I've, I've been realizing that it's, it's a bit of a struggle to get funding through the U.S., but we feel as though that is where the resources are. So I would love to find out from you how exactly, you know, if you could walk me through it, if we could talk about it afterward, how do we get funding for our initiatives to be able to really take it forward and collaborate? I mean, I love the four C's that you spoke about as well, and I think it works directly with what we are doing, and what so many other young people are doing as well, who are, who are creating, creating things from the ground up. You know, and uh, I mean, with us using Acriman, we have um, Acriman coming from here, Grandpa's magic seed. You know, it speaks about the seed that gave Acriman his powers, and I think people really love this. So I would love to give you a copy of it. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically my question. And thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think uh, it's interesting that you just said that because the first thing we have done in NIFA is to establish an exchange visitors program. I think that will be uh, the beginning of our global program and we can talk a little bit more about it but uh, I want to point out to Devida Tangi is the one who is going to, Devida will you stand up please? She is. She is going to coordinate the exchange visitors program. And what you are saying fits right into what we are thinking about is to invite visitors to come and visit us and then also have a reciprocal visits to their place and their country and so on. So that will be a good way to get started. Thank you. Dr. Misra, thank you so much for traveling from Washington to be part of this GFROS meeting. Uh, please join me in thanking him, expressing our appreciation. And we look. Thank you so much.